So uh, they asked me to do a retrospective on uh, HIV AIDS, and I think actually Susan was hoping that I uh, would use this as a kickoff for writing a book. Uh, I threatened throughout the 24 years of my career uh, that I would write a book uh, when people didn't uh, do things the way I thought they should. And I, uh, I tried to use that as a lever to get people to do <laughs> what, what I wanted them to do. Uh, but uh, now that I've retired and am moving on to other uh, areas, uh, I, I don't know that I'm going to write a book. I don't think I'm probably going to write a book, although I outlined about 23 chapters uh, and uh, have written a couple of the chapters. Uh, but uh, in any case, it's very difficult to try to put together some sort of a retrospective because there were so many things going on uh, in the early days of AIDS. And I'm not going to talk very much about the recent uh, developments, PrEP, and those sorts of things. But I thought maybe I'd just sort of focus on some of the early things that happened around HIV AIDS, how I got involved. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. These are the things I'm going to talk about. Uh, our early approaches to AIDS control, uh, some interesting uh, public health uh, cases that we dealt with along the way. And, uh, and then I want to sort of uh, applaud the scientific establishment for what I think of as the most incredible accomplishment uh, in my uh, 75 years now of uh, living and watching uh, science, uh, the, the development of uh, discovery of the, the virus and uh, development of treatments uh, that are effective, uh, not only in uh, keeping people from going on to develop AIDS, but also uh, effective in terms of preventing people now from, from becoming infected. So incredible progress. And then I want to talk just in the last couple slides about socio-behavioral impacts of HIV AIDS and uh, impact of the disease on society. Uh, my background is that uh, sort of revolves around five M's. Uh, I started off uh, really involved in music and uh, then in my early years I was into mathematics and computers, although where I went to college didn't have a computer uh, when I graduated in 65. I don't think anybody had a computer in 65. Yeah, uh, actually in 66 when I got to Rochester I took an elective in computers and they had a PDP-7 or something like that from Digital Corporation in Boston. And that was my first exposure to computers. But then I finished my training at Dartmouth uh, Hitchcock and uh, Dartmouth uh, Kiewit was uh, the president of Dartmouth and he was the, one of the main writers of BASIC and some of those programs. So I was very interested in... Pardon me? I was going to say you were a not-so-closet math geek. Yeah, I was, uh, I was a math geek. And I, uh, I also, because I went to the University of Rochester, was privileged to learn about the biopsychosocial model of disease from a guy named George Engel, uh, who was really sort of a guru of how biology and psychology and sociology all sort of intermix and how you can't really understand one without the other, and that disease is really a, a, a often a, a feature of all three of those things. I found as I was doing my training that I really enjoyed dealing with complex medical problems, and AIDS, of course, was one of the most complex medical problems one could deal with. And then I got involved in health services research, uh, working with mid-level practitioners uh, we were computerizing data on 10,000s of uh, cases of upper, upper respiratory infection or back pain or headache and trying to figure out more efficient ways of dealing with those uh, and th using Dartmouth computers. And then finally, I'm gay. Uh, men I was attracted to and, and uh, that sort of uh, brought me into the gay community and uh, helped 
uh, me uh, situate myself and understand uh, these kinds of issues and feel like I needed to get involved. And then finally, mountains. Uh, I broke my leg skiing in January, uh, skiing on mountains in Austria. So I'm sitting here for most of this talk because uh, I'm really not supposed to be bearing weight on it, although I've been doing that for some time. Uh, when AIDS began in Seattle, I was sort of, I came here in 75 from, from Dartmouth. And I was spending my time in thirds. About a, a third of my time was doing research on these algorithms for common clinical problems using Dartmouth's computers. And then about a third of my time was seeing patients and teaching uh, fellows and uh, residents. And then the last third was administration at uh, what was initially the US Public Health Service Hospital. You can see it out the window on the north end of Beacon Hill where Amazon was for a while. And then uh, in 1981, President Reagan, uh, one of my enemies, uh, <laughs> cut the funds to the U.S. public health hospital system. And uh, the hospitals, eight hospitals around the country, sort of became community hospitals. Uh, PacMed uh, was uh, emerged out of that. And I ended up, uh, instead of going off to the CDC, uh, where I might have been reassigned, uh, probably to the AIDS program <laughs> there, uh, instead, I stayed and helped to uh, develop PacMed, which is now an operation in many uh, sites around the region here. And uh, at that point, <laughs> I no longer had to take care of people who were in the military, retired, and, and active duty uh, people in Coast Guard, but we could open our practice to the general population. And I marketed my practice actively to the gay community because I was a gay man and I thought it'd be kind of interesting, and I didn't know that AIDS was just going to be around the corner, but uh, in 1982, uh, I had a sailboat and I was sailing out on Lake Washington and one of my friends uh, with his partner uh, were sailing with me and he said, you know, I'm having trouble at night uh, waking up soaking wet and I have these lumps and bumps that uh, I'm not sure what to make of them, but I don't feel well. I'm kind of uh, tired. And uh, he dis I discovered he didn't have any health care uh, system, and so I got him into PacMed, actually, and uh, talked one of the surgeons into uh, taking a biopsy of one of these lymph nodes. He had lymph nodes in places I didn't even know lymph nodes existed. And uh, we took a biopsy, and then I took it upstairs uh, to King Holmes, who was on the 11th floor. My office was on the 10th floor. And uh, King, who has uh, become uh, the, the main guru for HIV, AIDS, and STD in Seattle, and I looked at the slides, and uh, they were compatible with an article that had just been published in the Annals of Internal Medicine about progressive, or about persistent generalized lymphadenopathy, or what we'd call at the time PGL. And uh, it was known to be associated with AIDS, which had been identified about six months earlier. And so this was maybe one of the first cases we sort of recognized as fitting into this complex of AIDS and HIV. Sylvan, you'll be pleased to know, is still alive and lives over on the eastern side of Washington with his uh, family and uh, is still well. Not well, but he, he's, uh, he's as healthy as I am, I would say. I'm not totally well. Uh, so we evaluated him, and uh, then later that year, in 1982, I got a phone call from, I had helped to put together a group of uh, LGBT physicians, and I got a call from one of the physicians, and one of their friends uh, had become ill in Hawaii, a fellow who had lived here in Seattle, uh, but had a transfer to Hawaii uh, to a banking uh, position. And uh, he developed a bad cough and shortness of breath and fevers, and they discovered he had pneumocystis carinii pneumonia, which was one of the early hallmarks of AIDS. He went to San Francisco, uh, but uh, his friends here in Seattle uh, felt that he wasn't getting good care down there and they uh, suggested that he come back to Seattle and talk me into being his doctor. 
So I saw him in an outpatient setting and he was so sick that I put him in the inpatient <laughs> setting. And uh, not only did he have PCP, but he had another disease called Mycobacterium avium intracellulare, MAI, which was another AIDS-defining disease even at that point. And uh, <clears throat> we started him on some meds that I had never used before in my life uh, with a little trepidation because they were supposed to be very toxic and I wasn't sure how that was going to go. <clears throat> he stayed around <clears throat> in the hospital for about a week until we sort of felt that uh, we knew what these meds were doing and then finally discharged him. But after a while, he went back to Ohio uh, where his family was and, uh, and he died back there later on. So I had one case of AIDS uh, and uh, people around the community were knowing that I was taking care of people with AIDS and so they began sending more people to me with AIDS and I, uh, lo and behold I saw uh, a fellow referred to me by Country Doc uh, who was my gardener. Uh, I, I didn't uh, realize what his last name was but, but uh, he had a big Kaposi's lesion on the top of his uh, soft palate and uh, it was a very scary uh, appearance of, of, a, of a disease. That was Marvin, and uh, within about a month, uh, Marvin showed up at the emergency room over at Harborview, uh, manic, uh, wanted to spend all of his money and go to Japan and do some things, and it turned out he had cryptococcal meningitis. Uh, didn't want to have a lumbar puncture, but I ended up going over to Harborview and talking him into a lumbar puncture and we decided what he had and got him on treatment for that. Uh, but the treatment in those days was amphotericin. Uh, people called it amphoterable uh, because it was so incredibly toxic for people to take amphotericin. And uh, uh, we treated him for quite a while with amphotericin, but then uh, he began to have more problems. Turned out he had uh, cryptococcal pericarditis. The fluid sac around the heart was infected with the cryptococcal organisms and uh, it was uh, interfering with his circulation. So we had to do uh, pericardial taps to get the fluid out of there and uh, finally he died of disseminated cryptococcal infection. I ended up seeing more cases of uh, uh, toxoplasmosis, uh, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, the PML, cryptosporidiosis, my own partner developed cryptosporidiosis along the way, which is a uh, typically a fairly benign uh, parasitic infection of the intestine. Uh, quite often uh, subsides on, on its own, but in people with immune system deficiencies uh, can be a cause of terrible diarrhea and people can actually sort of die like they would die of cholera from uh, cryptococcal in infections. So uh, lymph nodes are typically in these sorts of places, but I, I mentioned that Sylvan had lymph nodes in the middle of his back. Uh, in here, he had lymph nodes on around his umbilicus and, and uh, places I never even knew that lymph nodes existed. Uh, this is a picture, I'm sorry for the lights, it's not very well, but maybe you can see that this is uh, really, really dark here. And this area here is actually uh, tissue that's dying because what uh, Kaposi's sarcoma does is it interferes with the circulation of the tissue and, uh, and so you end up getting uh, in the midst of the, in the middle of these tumors, uh, necrotic areas where the skin and the tissue is just sort of breaking down. It can no longer circulate and the cells are dying. These are the sorts of things you see uh, with toxoplasma encephalitis, uh, ring enhancing lesions in the brain scattered throughout causing seizures maybe or uh, inability to speak. That's all right. I think uh, just the, the just that only that only that one slide needed the lights down, <clears throat> and then ultimately people would end up looking 
sort of like this uh, as, as uh, AIDS wasting uh, down to skin and bones and, uh, and looking like they were in Dachau for, for uh, several months. These are the diseases that uh, we saw in those days, and these are old data. I, uh, now with uh, AIDS, I'm not sure that we would see the same distribution, but in the old days, typically a third or more of the cases were the pneumocystis bug that was causing uh, lung infection. Uh, wasting was very common. Uh, infections with candida or yeast in the esophagus or lung or elsewhere uh, were very common. Cytomegalovirus would blind people and cause brain disease. Kaposi's sarcoma, uh, I showed you on the gum. Uh, my patient had it on the roof of his mouth, but a very common place for it was right on the tip of the nose. Uh, incredible stigma uh, and, and uh, a real uh, a clear sign. I had one patient referred to me uh, because his uh, girlfriend uh, this was a gay man, uh, but he had lots of partners, and, but he had a, a woman friend who cared a lot about him and was worried about him. And she was worried because she was quite certain he was infected and he was having lots of partners. And I was, at the time, the public health officer, and my job was to tell him that he shouldn't be doing that. And I ended up taking him on as a patient. And then shortly after I saw him, he had a KS on his face and on his nose. And that pretty much stopped him from having partners, uh, was one of the ways of sort of dealing with it. Uh, anyway, these are the diseases, I'm not going to go through all of them, that, uh, that we saw in the early days and we still see in people who don't know that they're HIV infected and wait until the very last minute and then show up at the, at the end with some uh, a serious immune deficiency and, uh, and maybe die. Uh, in their first hospitalization uh, with AIDS. Uh, I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about some of the early history. And so I wanted to point out uh, this document that Tim Burak, who is sitting halfway down the table there, uh, put together and last edited in May 19 of uh, 2010, the year I retired. Uh, I guess after I retired, nobody cared anymore. Uh, but <laughs> we need to uh, get this updated uh, because uh, PrEP and some other things have happened uh, in, in recent years and they're on, not on this guide, uh, timeline. But anybody who wants a copy of this, uh, we can uh, get it to you. I can get it to you if you want. And I'm just showing you some of the early things that are on it, but it's about, I think it's about 20 pages long, isn't it, Tim? Yeah, of, of all the various things that happened along the way. Well, if I didn't lose interest, I retired. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but I don't think anybody in the AIDS project has updated it. So, Susan? Mm, just retiring doesn't mean you stop working, sir. <laughs> it just means you stop getting paid. Yeah. <laughs> So AIDS came, uh, was first identified in San Francisco and New York City in mid-1981. We had our first cases in 82. Uh, my S Sylvan with the uh, nodes still alive and Marvin with uh, crypto and Carrie with uh, pneumocystis and uh, hundreds more that I took care of. And in 82, uh, I think public health was way ahead of the curve in many of the cities in establishing an AIDS advisory group. And they included me, even though I wasn't uh, at that time a public health officer, because I had uh, put together a group of LGBT physicians. I was uh, invited to join that, that group. I think Tim was on that group probably. Uh, I know people from the Dorian group, which was a, a, a gay rights group. Uh, were involved in, and we also had representatives from bathhouses that were there, uh, scratching our heads, wondering, you know, sort of how to deal with this epidemic. In 1983, the Seattle Gay Clinic formed the Chicken Soup Brigade. Tim was involved in that. Uh, I was involved in 1983 in helping the Northwest AIDS Foundation get going. That's now called Lifelong AIDS Alliance because it merged ultimately with the Chicken Soup Brigade. 
1984, I was at a meeting of the American Federation for Clinical Research in Washington, D.C. when it was announced that they had identified the virus uh, that caused AIDS. And uh, Margaret uh, Heckler, who I think was the uh, uh, Secretary of HHS at the time, came onto the stage and said that within a couple of years we'll have a vaccine, we'll have this problem licked. Uh, we still don't have a vaccine, of course. 1985, and actually 1984, uh, people began to be uh, tested for, for uh, HIV, but really the test didn't become available widely until 1985. And there were a couple of international AIDS meetings. Uh, the first one was in Atlanta, uh, but there was also a meeting in uh, uh, Denver, Colorado of AIDS activists uh, where uh, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, learning, education went on, but also uh, pro proclamations sort of about uh, you need to include people with HIV AIDS in public health efforts and so on and so forth. And then 85, uh, we talked the city and the county into providing funds to establish an AIDS program uh, separate from the STD program. Hunter Hansfield was the director of the STD program but I think he sort of looked at AIDS coming down the pike and said, wait a minute, we need a new program for this. Uh, I, I, I've got enough problems uh, dealing with STDs. And, uh, but of course, he was very much involved with us all the way along. So by 88, we had a bunch of advisory committees, uh, the Public Health Advisory Committee, uh, another AIDS uh, project was, or the pr project was established uh, we established a hotline in 1984. Uh, we established an AIDS assessment clinic in 1985. We got a grant from the Centers for Disease Control in 85 to target gay men with uh, uh, HIV prevention activities. And that went from 85 until about 89. And then in 89, the CDC said, oh, well, we've done what we needed to do for gay men. Uh, now let's talk about harder to reach populations. And so we went after that grant. And the harder to reach populations were non-gay identified men who had sex with men. And, uh, and they were a difficult population to find, but we found them. Uh, and street youth and, uh, and uh, uh, females involved in, in uh, the sex trade. And so we uh, set up three different kinds of programs and uh, developed brochures. We learned about stages of change uh, that people uh, need to sort of have some pre-contemplative ideas about maybe using condoms. And then they need to begin to contemplate actually using condoms. And then they need to move into an action stage and then into a, a maintenance stage. Uh, a lot of uh, associate behavioral sort of stuff that we were dealing with in those days. And that grant took us until 94. In the meantime, we got a grant from HRSA and Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And we also got a grant from uh, 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 substance abuse, uh, NIDA, National Institute on Drug Abuse, to target IV drug users. And uh, in 1987, I remember we had a conference up at Battelle. Somebody was just telling me about a conference at Battelle. Uh, to talk about what to do for IV drug users. And we uh, were just hearing about uh, needle exchange programs, uh, but there were also bleach distribution programs, the idea of, of giving people little bottles of bleach so that they can clean out their syringes. Um, and the, the group that was at Battelle meeting uh, decided to prioritize these, and at the very bottom of the list was needle exchange. Uh, and somewhere up near the top was outreach and education and bleach distribution. And uh, we ended up talking uh, to our uh, local uh, senator, Slade Gorton, and talked him into uh, sort of thinking that bleach distribution was good. And then by 88, 89, we were moving into the needle exchange program, even though that was at the bottom of the uh, the list. We moved faster than, than it anticipated. So uh, when I took the job in 1986, 
I got recruited because I think I'd been involved with the gay community and because I'd been doing work with computers and epidemiology and so on. Uh, the future of public health uh, had, was, uh, was sort of being talked about. And there were really three basic functions that public health was supposed to do, monitoring and epidemiology, uh, assessment, policy development, but we could make policy, but generally we had little authority. We would just say, these are what we think should happen, but we'd try to talk people into doing it. Sometimes you could talk people into doing it by giving them money to do it. Uh, and we did have extra money sometimes from the CDC, and we got uh, some money for projects at the University of Washington. Roger Rothman uh, spun off a project uh, trying to talk to people who felt sort of sexually out of control as though they really couldn't control their sexual behavior and, and established hotlines for people to call in and, and get counseling over the phone about how maybe to be more uh, circumspect about uh, who they were having sex with and whether they were taking precautions and so on. And then assurance. Uh, in public health, uh, we, we needed to do primary prevention and uh, we needed both biomedical and, and behavioral sort of approaches. And then secondary prevention, dealing with people who had HIV and prevent complications and, and ongoing spread. And our thought right from the start was that what we probably needed to do, uh, I was a doc and Hunter was a doc, uh, was to promote HIV testing. Um, and I was just talking earlier about the controversies around testing. A lot of people in the early days didn't see any value in testing because what could you do? You, there was no treatment for it. Uh, all you would worry, all you would do was just sort of worry that now you're going to die of HIV. We didn't really know by 1985 when testing first became available what the prognosis was going to be for everybody with HIV. A lot of people were dying, but did that mean everybody was going to die or was it uh, going to be a small proportion of people? I had tested myself actually in 1985 and discovered I was positive. And so when I was offered the job as the director of the AIDS control program, I said to myself, well, this is a good way for a person, a gay person like myself to do something useful for my community and, and work my way, you know, until, until my end comes. And I figured it probably would come pretty fast because I was watching uh, friends and other people dying at a fairly rapid rate. But here I still am. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then we also did uh, efforts to try to minimize social harm and, uh, and of course, wanted to do research, evaluation, and development. How am I doing? Half hour. Uh, it's not moving. <laughs> So I, t I borrowed this from uh, Hillary Clinton. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if you're going to do AIDS control, it really does take a community. Uh, you've got to think about who are the partners involved in this. And uh, the partners clearly are people who are infected and, and affected. Even if they're not affected, if they're in the gay community, they're affected. Uh, public health, local, state, and federal. Uh, providers, we needed docs and we needed MSWs to, to begin to help people because people were becoming too weak to uh, maintain themselves very well in their own homes. Uh, and we needed non-governmental organizations like the Chicken Soup Brigade and Lifelong and Northwest AIDS Foundation. And of course, we wanted researchers involved to help us figure out what was going on. And the ideal roles were for uh, people to be aware uh, so that they're uh, risks, aware of their risks and aware of their status. Uh, again, many people didn't want to be aware of their status, but it made sense to us in the early days that that was maybe one of the most important things we could do was to get people aware of their status. Just on the hunch that most people were altruistic and that probably people who knew that they had HIV would not want to be spreading it to other people. And it turned out 
uh, some, some other work by the CDC in the uh, mid and late 80s showed that actually awareness of one's HIV status was the most important step uh, towards prevention. Uh, that if we could get everybody aware of their HIV status, that that would probably do the best we could do before there was antiretroviral effective treatment and, uh, and, and, and uh, PrEP. I'm not going to go through all these things, but that, that's sort of the way I was uh, looking at this whole issue of AIDS control. And uh, you could think of sort of uh, my role as a physician. Oh, okay. My role as a physician uh, to patients was, was uh, pretty clear. Uh, but the role of the physician to the community uh, was uh, something that was a, a different thing than taking care of indi individual patients uh, because uh, we had d different risk groups uh, and there were uh, sometimes conflicts between different risk groups. Initially, efforts focused uh, pretty exclusively on gay men and then within a very short space of time, uh, we expanded them to include IV drug users uh, but then as we began to realize that homeless people were at risk and people of color were at risk in different ways and uh, all, all these different groups, everybody began to want a piece of the prevention pie. And so it became difficult to try to figure out really how to divide up the money we had. At one point, I remember telling the planning council that uh, we had about $3 million for prevention and we had one and a half million people in, in King County and so one way we could do it is just uh, give everybody two dollars <laughs> and they could go out and, and, and buy a few condoms. Maybe even old, maybe nowadays only one or two condoms, I don't know, for, for two dollars. Uh, but obviously that didn't make sense because uh, uh, people in grade school probably weren't having sex and uh, uh, people my age, 75, or older might not be having as much sex as <laughs> as as younger people, uh, so uh, it really became an issue of uh, having to make political decisions about how do we, you know, how do we divide these dollars up, and, and we actually at one point developed a RAM and PAM model, a resource allocation <laughs> model, where we we looked at the size of the population, we tried to look at the the changes in the prevalence within the population. Uh, and the prevalence itself, gay men had higher prevalence than IV, IV drug users and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's sort of part of the philosophy. Next slide. And you could think of, uh, if you're a clinician, you could think of sort of taking a history. You know, the first the cases of AIDS was back in 82 in King County. Uh, 93, we had a peak incidence. We still didn't have a steady state. We had a past medical history, a family history, a social history. Next slide. And uh, you could sort of think of the various segments or the risk groups as, as the organs of our, of our, of our problem. Uh, MSMIDU was a small group, but it had the highest rate of HIV infection. And uh, that meant that there were around 400 HIV infected people and there annual incidence was about 4.4 percent at the time this slide was made in 19 in 2007. Uh, bigger population of men who have sex with men, smaller uh, prevalence but still <laughs> quite high, uh, equivalent to many places in Africa, and large number of HIV infected people and also very high uh, ongoing uh, spread of disease in the population. Next slide. And you could look at it this way too. Uh, of the problem that we had in King County, three quarters of it was men who had sex with men and another chunk of it was M MSM who were also injection drug users and very few of them were heterosexuals. Next slide. And if you look at uh, the population that's sexually mature, let's say that everybody uh, age 15 and up is sexually mature. I reduced the population to King County to 1.5. It really was around 1.7. And males and females are about half and half. 
and uh, you can see that almost 1% of males in all of King County are infected. And this was in, 19, in 2007. And in just Seattle, roughly 2% of all men were infected. Not, you Is know. That true? Yeah, at this point. Wow. Because most of them were gay men. Okay, next slide. But then we began to realize that it wasn't just IV drug users and gay men, but also there were racial impacts here. And uh, this is a slide from 2007 showing a higher rate in black uh, populations than in white populations and uh, higher rates in Hispanic and Native Americans. Next slide. And uh, in the last uh, couple of years, last five years or so of my tenure at the AIDS program, we began to recognize that foreign-born blacks actually uh, were uh, uh, more uh, impacted by HIV AIDS than U.S. born blacks, uh, about four times uh, the rate of infection. And uh, Roxanne, I know, is working on that problem, uh, not just locally, but also nationally, and, and trying to figure out who are these people and how do they, how do they get infected? What, are they infected in Africa or do they get infected after they get here? So on and so forth. Next slide. So uh, this is just a cute slide that I got from Switzerland <laughs> uh, sh sh to, to say that we had a bunch of programs that we developed for HIV infected people. Uh, and uh, we wanted to make sure that partners of infected people knew that they had gotten exposed. And so that was a very controversial issue that uh, was very difficult to deal with sometimes. Substantial exposure, sometimes people would get stuck by a needle. Uh, and then we'd have to worry about what's the possibility that they got HIV. And then uh, there was a lot of overlap with hepatitis there because uh, hepatitis is generally more transmissible than HIV and people got stuck with needles. So we would end up doing hepatitis care in our program as well. Uh, behaviors endangering public health, like the guy with the Kaposi's on his nose that was having lots of partners and, and was infected. And sometimes we'd have to uh, tell these people that they ha had to stop or uh, we would have to take some sort of legal action on them. Uh, again, awareness of infection turned out to be one of the more important things. Uh, we developed a one-on-one -on -one clinic for new HIV-infected people. And after I stopped seeing patients myself in 1994 when my own T cells got very low, I spent most of my time uh, seeing patients in the one-on-one -on -one clinic and uh, deputizing them uh, to become my deputy AIDS control officer because they had HIV and I couldn't be with them every minute of every day uh, to make sure that the disease didn't get spread. So I would hold my hand up and we, <laughs> we would uh, deputize. <laughs> Uh, and we would re refer for ongoing care and monitor adherence. Next slide. So this is the way the epidemic started off. Uh, the red bars are cases of AIDS. We peaked in 93. And these are the deaths which followed very closely behind the dark bars. And they peaked about 1995. And it's interesting that the peak of uh, HIV uh, occurred about 10 years after probably the peak of, H, of, of AIDS, rather, occurred about 10 years after the peak of HIV, because that's about the, uh, the period between uh, becoming infected and HIV and, and, becoming, and having AIDS if you don't uh, uh, get any kind of treatment. Along came a highly active antiretroviral treatment in 1995, and you can see that the death rate went way down. And next slide. And, and went down even further. And then in this slide, I, I tried to follow out the data some more, but we also tried to then sort of back calculate and figure out what the, what the curve might have looked like for HIV, because we didn't have testing you know, in any large numbers in those earlier days. And nowadays, the curve is actually lower. I think it's probably about half, about 150 new infections a year. I forget what, uh, 180? Well, that's okay, a little bit higher than I thought, but and the AIDS, but we're still seeing cases of AIDS all the way out to, I'm sure, 2018 because people get diagnosed late. Next slide. So 180 is the AIDS cases? HIV, 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 HIV diagnosis. 
108, 108 new HIV diagnoses. How many new AIDS cases do you know? 100. 100? Something like that. So I want to talk uh, just briefly about a couple of interesting issues. One of the issues that we had to deal with right off the bat that was a socio-behavioral issue was uh, how are we going to encourage people to test and to test repeatedly. The CDC study that we had from 85 until uh, 89 was uh, designed to be a longitudinal study and we wanted to be able to follow people over time and find out how much people were converting and what their behaviors were and how those behaviors were changing. And, uh, and so we wanted to be able to compare uh, test today with test six months from now and test a year from now and test uh, 18 months from now. And yet a lot of people were very nervous about being tested and uh, they weren't willing in many cases to test if they had to give us their name because they were afraid that uh, they couldn't trust public health or somehow the name might get out or they might lose a job, they might uh, uh, be stigmatized uh, by the knowledge, other people's knowledge that they had HIV or AIDS. So we ended up, uh, I think it was Tim who did most of this work, actually negotiating with the community about what are the options here. And we decided to go with an anonymous testing. And yet we developed uh, a way of anonymous people registering. Uh, if they gave us the first two letters of their mother's maiden name, the first two letters of their city of birth, first two letters of their father's first name, and a few other things like that, that uh, people could, I'm sorry? Middle initial. Middle initial. And then after a while, we, they gave us their year of birth uh, as they got more trusting of us. And, uh, and we were able to follow people uh, really quite well, almost as well as other longitudinal studies. Uh, and uh, next slide. Uh, shows that the way we got people to come back is we created this thing called the study, Be a Star Study, and that was Marilyn Monroe, that was Oscar Wilde, uh, Judy, uh, Billy Holiday, is that? Uh, James Dean. These were all dead people. We didn't have to worry about their, uh, their identities and their, and their privacy. And, uh, and, and we said November is the Marilyn Monroe month. So join the study, be a star. If you joined in November, then you'd be a Marilyn Monroe. And every six months we'd advertise for all the Mar Marilyn Monroes to come back. <laughs> and then the next month we'd advertise for all the James Deans to come back. And then we'd, so on and so forth. So next slide. And uh, we were able to compare study participants to other eligible men, we showed some differences there. Next slide. These are old slides, so I'm not going to show, the data don't matter. <laughs> and, and we were able to, uh, you know, look at the number of people who were registered anonymously, and as different things happened, we could see changes in the proportions of people who were registered anonymously. Uh, so we get some sense about whether the community was comfortable with us or not comfortable with us. Next slide. So that was, that was one of our interesting conundrums, is how we were going to uh, get, and we got like 3,000 uh, enrollees, I think, over the first five years of that study. Uh, so we did a fairly good job of getting testing uh, ensconced in the community and people to begin to get tested and respect us and, and realize that we could keep their data confidential and so on. This was another interesting thing that happened in, in November of 27 of 1998, uh, just after Thanksgiving. If you know where the Aurora Street Bridge is, think of yourself coming down from the north onto the Aurora Street Bridge. This is the one that goes over the... Over the ship canal. Ship canal. Yeah. Wow. And the bridge, the bus, is a, it was an articulated bus, two-section bus, coming down the bridge. And somebody gets up and shoots the bus driver twice in the head, kills him, and then shoots himself. And then the bus careens on the other, goes across the, side of the other side of the bridge and over the bridge down onto an apartment building underneath and then falls another 30 feet uh, to the ground. Uh, one person was killed in addition to the two that were shot. 
and uh, 32 people were injured. And I got a call, this was on a Friday, I got a call the following Monday that one of the people on the bus was HIV infected and bled copiously. And uh, I talked with Alonzo Plow, who was our director at the time, and said, uh, we've had a potential substantial exposure incident. And we ended up deciding to announce that this had happened. Uh, we were very careful not to announce the identity or any information about the case himself, herself. And, uh, and a lot of people got tested up and down the West Coast. Uh, the EMTs we weren't worried about so much because they had already been trained about how to deal with substantial exposures and we, we figured they sort of knew how to deal with blood exposures. But we were worried that maybe a lot of other people had gotten blood into their eyes or in their mouth or some, you know, into cuts on their hands or something of that sort. Uh, it turned out nobody got infected that we uh, found out about, but it was a very interesting sort of situation, a substantial exposure in a, in a mass casualty situation. Next slide. This is another interesting issue. Uh, that uh, Kaiser Family Foundation sort of counted the number of citations in the media having to do with HIV or AIDS. And you can see that in 1987, it peaked uh, when AZT was approved in the United States as the first drug for HIV. But then uh, Magic Johnson announced he had AIDS. And I, uh, there's another story I could tell you there is that we brought lots of people in uh, to uh, 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 enable testing uh, because uh, Magic Johnson all of a sudden encouraged a lot of people to test. And so we had a huge uh, increase in demand for HIV testing. And uh, interestingly, the number of positives we found over the next couple of weeks uh, was cut in half because all the people who tested were low risk individuals. So even though we sp spent probably two or three times as much uh, testing d during the next uh, three or four weeks after uh, Magic Johnson announced, uh, we didn't find as many positives as we'd been finding before. Uh, so this other curve here is the number of infections going up. And so I, I was always showing this slide, uh, trying to get the media to move their line back up uh, more equivalent to the no increasing number of HIV cases. Next slide. And this is the final interesting thing I'm going to talk about, I guess, uh, interesting and concerning. Uh, we got early data on uh, rates of gonorrhea, the blue bars, uh, rates of chlamydia, these bars, and the syphilis and the white bars. And you could see from 81, 82 to 93, 94, gonorrhea cases went way down, syphilis cases went down almost to nothing, and chlamydia cases went down in men who had sex with men. And not too surprising, all those things went down because people were, were beginning to hear about HIV AIDS. But notice that the first AIDS organizations didn't start until these numbers had already almost halved. And then uh, by the time we got any substantial state dollars, they were already at their nadir. <laughs> so, it, it, Leading the way. You know, I was, I was, I was, I was grateful to have the money, <laughs> but and when we used it, I think very well. But uh, I just want to point out that uh, socio-behaviorally, it wasn't the money that did it. It was people's fear, I think, uh, of seeing their friends and and uh, colleagues becoming ill. And then what happened? The treatments became effective in '95, '96, and. Gonorrhea goes up, syphilis goes up even higher than it had been before HIV AIDS. And the next slide shows uh, from the data that I didn't have there, even higher rates of gonorrhea in the next slide in gay men uh, and of syphilis. Uh, and the rates have gone up much higher than they were before HIV AIDS in gay men uh, because now that we have effective treatment, people don't have to worry so much about HIV anymore. They don't have to use condoms. They don't have to uh, be all that safe uh, because gonorrhea and syphilis are treatable. Well, syphilis can be a problem. You can get uh, tertiary syphilis and 
strokes and go blind uh, before the treatment is effective, or you, sometimes it's not effective. Next slide. So I, I want to finish with uh, a slide saying that uh, the developments, achievements in HIV AIDS have just been outstanding. I graduated from med school in 70, and understanding of viruses was just beginning. In uh, 1982, Larry Corey and other docs uh, were the first people to really uh, show effective treatment against the first virus, herpes. And that was 12 years after I graduated from med school. Uh, the very first uh, effective treatment for a virus. So uh, finding the cause in 84, uh, having a test in 85, and treatment in 80 and 96, uh, to me was uh, just an incredible achievement in medicine. Uh, not only have we learned more about HIV and uh, its varieties and resistance, but we have a lot of drugs now to, ad to address HIV. Uh, we've developed uh, proven standards of care for, for HIV and many of its complications. Uh, we've discovered new diseases like uh, Kaposi's sarcoma, uh, herpes virus, and understanding of rare diseases. And uh, thanks to um, Martina and other people, we've got new methods of modeling the epidemics and uh, figuring out where they're going and why. Next slide. And uh, this just shows the incredible number of drugs from the first drug AZT up to uh, 2008. We had uh, like 32 drugs. And I just counted up from nine, or 2009 until the present, another 15 drugs have been added. So there are altogether almost 50 different drugs now that address HIV, uh, many of them in combination. So it's just an uh, incredible resource that we have. Next slide. Uh, so if you think about epidemiology and biomedical prevention from 81 through 87 when AZT was approved, all we could do then was identify risk groups and plausible routes of transmission and identify agents and develop tests and identify and attract the high risk to voluntary counseling and testing uh, and get them to join studies and begin treatment. Uh, and, and the treatments were experimental at that time. I was in uh, the 016 study until they kicked me out because I uh, went skiing too often. And uh, in 1988 to 96, uh, when we had uh, antiretroviral drugs uh, announced, all we could do was increase and broaden HIV counseling and testing and begin treatment of persons. And we began treatment of persons with uh, fewer than 350 T cells. Uh, in 2006, the Centers for Disease Control finally said, let's test everybody who's an adult uh, who might be infected. In 2009, uh, we began to treat even more people uh, if their counts were less than 500. And it wasn't until 2012 that everybody with HIV was deemed uh, to need HIV treatment. And in 2014, we actually began treating HIV negatives if they were at high risk. Uh, as a way of uh, curtailing this epidemic. I actually suggested that as a possibility back in 2009. I was getting ready to give a talk to the Board of Health, and uh, Gary Goldbaum said, oh, that'll never be approved, uh, treatment of negatives with uh, effective treatment. And, and uh, it happened five years later. So I was good at forecasting. There are a lot of socio-behavioral barriers to all of this stuff. I, I've talked a lot about them already, I think. But the uh, human misunderstanding and fear, especially around sex, uh, people sometimes uh, deny their feelings. They don't understand their feelings. Uh, I have met people in their 40s and 50s who uh, finally divorced their wife and decided that they were gay because they really now had feelings that they, that they had had for a long time, but they were confused about and, and didn't understand them. Uh, and if you talk about individuals can do strange things, populations can do strange things. Think of the recent election. Okay. <laughs> uh, stigma, of course, is a, is a major issue. Uh, HIV and, and AIDS, uh, fear and invisible invis markings, the, the Kaposi's on the nose, the wasting people would see 
uh, folks uh, buying groceries in markets, walking with walkers and looking like they had no skin in, on their bones. Uh, inadequate protections for the vulnerable. Uh, there needed to be changes in laws. Uh, we also needed to change laws uh, allowing people to get sterile syringes in pharmacies, for example. And, uh, and then we needed political support for care and needed resources. So sociobehavioral stuff is very important. That's why we're all here together today anyway. But then there's also been sort of the impact of AIDS on society. Uh, there's been, I think, uh, an incredible uh, new awareness of gays and men who have sex with men as a result of AIDS. Uh, Rock Hudson, Liberace, uh, Tony Perkins, uh, all sort of raised, I think, people's awareness as well as, as people began to get uh, tested and discovered that they had HIV and often discovered that they had AIDS. They would come out in the process. and more and more people began to see people who were LGBT in their community. And so it has resulted, I think, in the approval for gay marriage and, and better attitudes towards LGBT folks, although we've obviously got a long way to go. Uh, harm reduction was strengthened. Uh, we started with bleach distribution, uh, but uh, we don't do that anymore. Uh, but needle exchange, I think, we exchange more needles in King County than even Manhattan uh, exchanges. Uh, so we are very seriously trying to keep the infection low. And as, a, and as a result, we have, I think, the lowest HIV infection rate in injection drug users. And that's the main way women get infected and also the lowest rates of HIV infection in, in, uh, in, in newborns of any place in the country. Uh, Primarily, I think, attributable to needle exchange and a very aggressive programs uh, targeting IV drug users. So uh, I think that's my last slide, maybe, uh, except that, uh, no, there's one more slide. I want to thank uh, the people that have been my uh, bosses. Patricia McInturf, uh, Bud Nicola was my first health officer. Alonzo Plow was a very uh, helpful health, health officer. Hunter Hansfield, Russ Alexander, Gary Goldbaum, I should have King Holmes in that list because he just walked in. <laughs> but, but even if he hadn't walked in, he should be there. Uh, Tim Burek was uh, the manager of our program for the first 10 years or so. And then Frank Chafee uh, took over and Carol Wood did part of the program. And then I had some wonderful administrative helpers and wonderful section leaders and a lot of community leaders. So I've taken the full hour, but I'm willing to stay around and answer questions if uh, anybody wants to ask them. That was the one.